Welcome to the All's Authors Podcast. We're so glad you found us. We're the global community of authors writing about Alzheimer's and dementia from personal experience to light the way for others. I'm Mary Ann Shuko, a registered nurse, author, and dementia daughter. And I'm Christy Byrne Yates, a licensed educational psychologist, dementia daughter, Al's author, and coach focused on the sandwich generation. Please join us for bi-weekly episodes with our authors as we talk about their dementia journeys, sharing intimate details and painfully obtained knowledge to help others currently on that path. We hope these stories offer you comfort and support as we strive to break the silence and stigma surrounding a dementia diagnosis. May one of our authors speak to your experience. This is the Whole Care Network. Helping you tell your story one podcast at a time. Content presented in the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the host and guest and may not represent the views and opinions of the Whole Care Network. Always consult with your physician for any medical advice and always consult with your attorney for any legal advice. And thank you for listening to the Whole Care Network. I'm Vicki Tapia from All's Authors. If you enjoy the podcast, you'll enjoy reading more of our author's stories in one of our anthologies, Alzheimer's and Dementia Caregiving Stories. Each volume offers a wealth of information and a preview of each title to help you pick the perfect resource. You'll find them on our free resources page at allsauthors.com with a variety of caregiver tip sheets. So after the podcast, take a few minutes to check it out. Remember, you are not alone. Hi, welcome to Books and Chit Chat with All's Authors and Aging and Amazing. Thank you for spending your precious time with us. I'm Mary Ann Shuko, a founder and manager at All's Authors, a global community of authors writing about Alzheimer's and dementia from personal experience to light the way for others. I'm here with my podcast co host and producer, Christy Byrne Yates. Our friends at Aging and Amazing are not with us tonight, but we want to remind you to check out their online community to learn more about the services they offer. We're all aging and amazing. We would like to welcome you here tonight to discuss a beautiful book that I had the privilege of reading. I was the member of our acquisitions team who somehow found Carolyn or she found us. I don't remember how that worked. Um, And how it works is the author's who may be interested in in having their books presented by all's authors, they'll make contact with us or we make contact with them. And then they we um, ask them to send us a book. And I was the one who received Carolyn's beautiful book, Walking with Faye. And I'm going to tell you that it was gripping, that I loved it. It was one of the, I have to say, it was one of the best ones that I had read. Um, her story was, so personal she shared a lot and i don't think she held any punches back and the relationship with her mom and the um turmoil that they encountered was um was right there on the page and what really got me at the end is that um it happened during covid it was, I think, the second book that I read that had um, COVID in the story. And now we've gotten a couple of others, but it was just really new. Um, and her caregiving journey and, and the end of her mother's life during the pandemic was just unbelievable. It was unbelievable. So congratulations on that, Carolyn. You did a really great job on your first book. It was your first book, wasn't it? It was. Thank you, Marianne. Yeah, I just really enjoyed it. And um, I'm glad to meet you and, and we can talk more about it. I've been following you. And it's <laughs> so, so nice to see you in person, finally. <laughs> it's been almost two years. 
Yes, it's been a while. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's been and a while. Denise signed on to the book club, and um, you, for an interesting piece of trivia, Denise is in my book. She is oh. the Denise, the walker, the walk, the person who walked with my mom when I couldn't, because oh, okay. every time I would try to walk with her, she would want to jump in someone's car and and take off. And Denise is also the <laughs> impersonating Faye person on the front cover of my book, because I didn't oh. have an actual photo that I wanted of my mother and I. So we went You're about welcome. getting something that was You're very close and then having it computerized and she's impersonating Faye. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I think that's, that's a first. The- that's a first Faye. for us. That's great. Yeah. That's really neat. I love trivia like that. Thank you for coming, Denise. How wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Great. So um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, Carolyn? I know that you were living in, in Georgia and you retired, moved to Idaho. And um, you the, the opening to your book is, is really like, I mean, it's such a great hook. I mean, you could write a book about writing hooks because you said that... Um, you kidnapped your mother. It's like the opening line of the book is how you kidnapped your mom. So can you just tell us, uh, tell us your story? Tell us how this all came to be. I I moved to Atlanta, Georgia um, in my early twenties. And I was born and raised in upstate New York where um, my parents still lived. And after a couple of Christmases coming down to, to Georgia to visit me, they decided to move move nearby not too close because the city was nothing they were interested in but they they moved to rural north georgia and it didn't uh, it didn't take more than just a few years my my husband and i at the time had made plans to retire to the west and um we were really really nervous to tell my mother that we were going to be moving because my father had recently died once we got to um idaho though it was a daily conversation with my mom, uh, coffee with Faye, basically. And um, I started noticing things, um, repeated stories on loops, um, uh, a mysterious man who she was sure was watching the outside of her house. Um, things like that were starting to, you know, prickle, prickle up my ears a little bit. And um I was very busy trying to uh, ignore them, you know, chalk them up to the quirkiness of my mother getting older. Until one morning, I received a phone call very early. It was still dark out. And it was from her local sheriff calling me to tell me that he'd been um, fielding quite a few phone calls from concerned citizens that she was driving on the wrong side of the road and erratic and cutting people off, that sort of thing. And, um, asking me to do something about it. Uh, At that point, I still knew I wasn't going to be able to do something about it because I was just not going to be able to convince my mother from 3000 miles away to give up her driver's license. So I, I really didn't, I just kept hoping it would get better on its own. And then I got another phone call from the department of health and human services uh, saying that my mother had been admitted to the hospital. This was weeks later she had um, fallen and her hairdresser discovered her uh, on her floor from a missed hair appointment. And when they released her from the hospital, she had no one to call. She couldn't remember any numbers. She couldn't think of anybody who could come get her. So they assigned her to a nurse who brought her home and found my phone number on her refrigerator. And that was the fire that was lit under me because this, this nurse was livid. She accused me of being a bad daughter. Um, She told me that if I didn't do something, the Department of Health and Human Services would step in and do something. I didn't know what that was exactly, but it was um, it was enough to get me Mm -hmm. out to Georgia. Um, I was embarrassed. You know, I was Mm. mortified. I had these daily conversations with my mother. I had talked myself into the fact that she was fine. I saw her on an annual basis. Her house was dirtier every year. Her kitchen was more cluttered every year. I wasn't allowed to clean anything when I got there, but I did my four days and, you know, went back home 
and felt like I had, you know, gone and seen my mother and and everything was reasonably fine. She insisted it was fine. Mm -hmm. She wanted absolutely no intervention and she wanted nobody to tell her what to do. And she uh, liked her life. So I, I happily agreed to that. You know, you look back on that and you say, gosh, Caroline, why couldn't you have seen all this? You know, but at the time, I'd never even had the discussion about dementia with anybody. I didn't have any friends who had family members uh, with dementia. I didn't use that term. We called it, you know, well, we called it old age senility or we called it quirkiness. You know, those were the terms I used. Wow. I do want to make a comment, though, what you said um, about the nurse she brought your mother home. Then it was it the nurse from the hospital, or what? It- yeah, it was a it was a caregiver. It was a um, they called it DFACS, Department of Something Family Services, okay. and they assign you with a, a home health care nurse. So her she was hmm. assigned to see my mother and visit her once a day to make sure that she was taking her meds and basically upright. Yeah, because I mean hmm. I'm a nurse and I was a discharge planner or a case manager from a hospital and right. That is not something that we would have ever have done is to send an elderly person. It was a like a county services um, Mm -hmm. hospital contracted with a county services uh, organization. Okay. So, um, well, you know, we, we have heard stories like this, obviously, and through our experience with the also authors. um, I think that a lot of people, they don't want to see what's right in front of them because it creates change. And we Absolutely, we don't like change, and also we don't. We're not here to tell our parents what to do. They tell us what to do, even when we're adults, right? right? A lot of us, we're mm-hmm. still. And I think you said that in the post that you wrote for us on our website about being a good daughter. I was the good daughter my mother raised. Don't make. We absolutely had that dynamic. Mm-hmm. Um, I was, I was her daughter. I was subordinate. I listened. I did not. I did not talk back, and I did not provide uh, my opinion about anything that was just the way Mm -hmm. that was just the way it was Mm -hmm. and you're the only child no I'm the youngest oh so where are the others well my brother and my sister happily let me take over um they were frightened of her they had been reporting to me also like mom doesn't sound you know mom sounds strange or she's saying this or she's telling us that I don't think it's true and and they just didn't know what to do with her. Um, I didn't know what to do with her, but I just needed to get her close. Mm-hmm. So, okay. So I, I did that. Were your siblings still living up in New York then? My sister lived in New York and my brother lived in Atlanta, Georgia. He had oh, followed okay. me down a couple of years after I got there and um, just had no interest in, mm-hmm. in providing that kind of help to my mm-hmm. mom to, to say it plainly. Mm-hmm. I think that 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 is also a, a story that I hear often. It, it, sometimes it's all of the kids get together, but more than likely it's maybe one gets elected. Sometimes it's the short straw. <laughs> I know for me, in my case, it was I was here and my parents were 10 minutes away and in, in California and everybody else was, you know, across the country. So it's interesting how someone gets elected to this challenge. I took it on and um, I was told by so many people that I should be upset. And I remember feeling confused by that because I was relieved. You know, they, they weren't interfering. They weren't telling me I couldn't handle it one way or another. If any, if either of them had flown out to my little town in North Idaho, I would have had to drive two hours to the airport to get them. I would have had to find a place for them to stay all the the while trying to deal with my mom. So it was a relief to me that they kind of just held back and let me handle things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Sometimes, sometimes if you have to have a committee all the time with your siblings, it really makes it hard to get anything going. So um, yeah. I, I would say that was, you know, as challenging, challenging as it might have been for you, maybe that was also, it, it's nice to feel a little bit more autonomous and like, let me take care of this. Let me take charge. 
my sister was always available for me on the phone. And there were so many times in the earliest days that I called her just sobbing, you know, over something my mother had said to me that was, you know, unbelievably cruel and unusual. So I would call her and she would just listen. And it was good. It was, it was really good. Mm -hmm. That was all I needed at the time. Yes. Yes. Well, that's lovely. That's lovely that she could be there for you that way. That's important. One of our other authors said his brother took on the task of the parents. And he said, my job was to take care of my brother. So those people who maybe don't want to step into the caregiver role, you can always be the source of support for the caregiver. Yeah. Yeah. that, That works well. So what happened when you um, decided to swoop in and and take mom and and put her on a jet and bring her across the country? Yeah. All hell broke loose. (laughs) Right. My, my sister did come down to Georgia from New York and um, drive my mother back to um, her place while I cleaned out uh, my mother's house, which took a whole lot longer than I had planned. And then um, drove a U-Haul trailer with my mother's things um, back to back to North uh, Idaho. So Roxanne got on a plane to fly her um, from New York to North Idaho uh, without any ID because we couldn't find any of my mother's ID. And we were able to find a, um, a photocopy of an expired driver's license and an old Medicare card and a, a photocopy of her birth certificate, I believe that I fed, I FedExed to New York and they lost the package um, and finally found it again and um, had to go to the airport and go to the security office and see if they would let them on the plane. And, uh, and they did, but they got to Denver and my sister called me. I was still unpacking everything from the U-Haul van the day before they were to arrive. They were at Denver. They were going to have a a red eye um, in and then spend the night. And my mother wouldn't come out of the bathroom stall. She was, uh, she locked herself in there and told my sister she wasn't going any further and she knew what she was doing. So I just stood there in my mother's new living room surrounded by boxes. And I just said, well, she's yours then. (laughs) (laughs) Because if you can't get her here, (laughs) I can't help you. And lo and behold, they arrived the next day. That's amazing. So your mom didn't know that she was being relocated no it was a summer vacation okay we were we were bringing her out to see me just to spend a little bit of time and Mm -hmm. then she was going to go home and that's how we got my mother to do many things that i needed to get done Um, she was just she believed just enough to be able to um, learn to lie to her which was terrifying for me because i never lied to my mother so uh you know therapeutic fibbing as they mm-hmm. like to call it. I, mm-hmm. I became pretty good at that. Yeah. Yeah. Including getting really... her first uh, assisted living home. Yeah. It's really hard <laughs> to do that, to switch in your head. I, I have to now tell my mother something that's not true. You and, know, you're and... going to get caught. <laughs> you're sure of it. And then all of a sudden she believes you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so by this point, had you determined or been told or been given the diagnosis that she had dementia? I had, I tried when she got here, I, we had to start over with everything. She had diabetes and uh, we couldn't find any of her medications and we had lost her, her current Medicare card. All of this had to, had to be fixed. And it's a long, tedious process that I'm sure you know well about. Mm -hmm. But I was working on getting all that fixed, including getting her um, a physician here. And uh, I called ahead and said, there's something wrong with my mother. I believe she has, you know, Alzheimer's. And I'm going to tell her that we're coming for a (laughs) an annual exam. And I would like you to see if you can find out if she does. And please don't say anything to her because she's very suspicious. (laughs) And that is exactly what they said when we walked in for her appointment. I understand you're here for a cognitive neurological exam to see if you have Alzheimer's. And I just, you know, I was floored and my mother looked at them and she said, oh, no, I'm not. (laughs) Mm. So, and Denise knows well that my mother's attitude toward many of those things. 
So she was, she was non-compliant is what they called her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, and how frustrating it is for those of us who are caregivers to like, be like, um, you were supposed to be on the same page with me here. We were doing something that they licensed, licensed physician. Are you? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. You think that they would know better than uh, that's just astounding. It is in this day and age. Right. Right. Yeah. This was 2012. I don't know if that was, you know, everything is kind of going at breakneck speed, isn't it? We're making, they're making so many discoveries or the beginnings of a discovery. They're starting to pinpoint the plaques, you know, and the the, the, the calcifications mm -hmm. and, right. you know, linking it to diet from 20 years earlier. And these are things that are just now coming out, aren't they? So even in 2012, when you, you talked with me earlier, before we started recording about, you know, authors of books, I was searching for that book. That's the only reason I wrote this book mm -hmm. was because the whole time I was trying to care for my mother, who was as slippery as a snake, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't figure out what to say when she fired that next tennis ball at me. You know, how was I supposed to respond in a way that would not inflame her and would not cause her to mistrust me? And yet all I wanted to do the whole time was defend myself, you know, and I wanted right. to make it go away. No, mom, I'm not stealing from you. But also there is no man breaking into your house at night and moving all the magazines around. You know, when, even when she was convinced that there was, how did I explain to her or how did I diffuse that situation? I had no idea. So I went to the library and I read and I read and I just couldn't find a book that had enough daily interactive examples of Joe on the street. You know, the, the average person, not a 36 hour day. You know, that book was fabulous, but it was to me, geared more toward a further along stage of dementia. Whereas my mother was in the early stages. She was believable half the time. So that was just enough to keep me so off balance that I didn't know for sure if she was pulling my leg or if she really believed what she was saying. And was she really being mean to me or was that just the dementia talking? And I just, every day was this teeter totter for me. And I, I feel I definitely handled it badly. Mm. Wow. Well, yeah, I, I, I can relate to how you feel that you, you, you handled it badly. But I, I mean, I also really resonate with what you're saying about I couldn't find the book, I couldn't find the information. And this one was like the 36 hour day. This is kind of it but it wasn't where we were and that is and and so you wrote the book that you needed which right. which is i think where a lot of al's authors are but how wonderful that you're sharing this because this is exactly what people do need is that it does feel really slippery and not knowing i mean our our people can be very still be very articulate and very um mm -hmm. sound like they're very lucid and and yet the next, next moment, you know that they are not there. <laughs> they're, they're in another uh, um, thought pattern. And so it's, it's challenging. One of the most frightening things for me during that time was the perception from others that I was being overreactive and controlling and was inserting myself into my mother's life unnecessarily. I, I was receiving those kinds of looks from people when they would have a conversation with my mother that sounded perfectly normal. And then the same token, I was also receiving judgment from some people who felt like I wasn't getting involved enough and mm -hmm. I wasn't taking control and I wasn't making her do, you know, or making her safe, which was an impossibility. She wouldn't stay inside her house. I would drive away and look in my rearview mirror and I would see her coming out that front door with her hat pulled down tight. She was off and running, just waiting for me to pull out of the driveway. So I just didn't, I didn't know what to do. So where would she go? And she would She'd take a walk. That was what she did. My phone pinged all day long from people saying, Hey, Carolyn, your mother's on the South Hill. She's walking down towards Safeway. 
hey, Carolyn, your mother's walking up the South Hill. She's got two grocery bags in her hands and she's all stooped over. Hey, Carolyn, I've got your mother in the back of my car. She flagged me down and I pulled over and picked her up. I mean, it was any number oh, wow. of, of those situations. But what I did was I put my name and my number on her car, uh, on her house key. She didn't have an address on there because I was afraid somebody would, you know, come into her home with her. But that woman would take that house key out and show it to anybody and say, look, this is, this is my daughter. And she'd show it to them and she, they just dial me. And that was a saving grace for me in my small town. That was how I often had eyes on my mother. It's like you had a little set of spies there. Yeah. (laughs) And she was just off and running. I think, you know, at the time I felt like she was doing it to spite me, you know, like, what is she doing? I just set her, I just put her to bed, you know, and off she goes. Oh my gosh. I, I, I never knew. And that's the other struggle. I think I see a lot of people have is they think that they're doing it on purpose. And, and I don't believe that that's necessarily the case. You know, I think that they think in their minds, my mother thought I'm escaping. I'm, <laughs> I'm going home. I don't like it here anymore. You know, any number of things I think were going through her head And all I could see was she was defying me. You know, I told her to good night. I'll see you in the morning. Stay here. (laughs) And, and she defied me. Mm. Well, and that fear for her safety too, like, oh my gosh. And uh, so you, how bad do you let it get? You know, (laughs) how much of a rope do you give her before you do have to, you know, get in, get in there. So you bring her from um, Georgia by way of New York and she's in Idaho with you now and she's in her own home somewhere near you, right? Oh, right up the street. I guess it's a small town. So right up the street. And, um, and by this time you've kind of connected with um, doctors and where did you go from there? How did you, how did, because I think this is a really hard thing, right? When do we know when that's the next level? Like what's the next thing? And this is 2012. So, and really we think that that's, I mean, for me, I feel like 2012 was like last year, right? But it's over 10 years ago, right? So it's, what is it? Six, I don't know, but a lot of 14 years ago and a lot has changed. So yes, we do, we're knowing a little bit more, but. um, Well, the Alzheimer's Association didn't even have their whole website up and up like it is now yeah. there wasn't the 24 hour hotline mm-hmm. there weren't all of the uh, all of the answering sessions yeah. that had there were no podcasts on dementia mm-hmm. none right, right. And, and literally a dozen books you know in my library I mean I could have I suppose online but even online you know it wasn't 12 years ago wasn't the the online presence you know that, right. that we have now mm-hmm. exactly Exactly. You know, so where it went from there was I spent the summer. I mean, I got her here in uh, in March, I believe. And by October, I had her in an assisted living home. The one thing that I promised her I would never do ever. Mm-hmm. And it was my ex-husband, Sam, who called me one day and, and said, Carolyn, I just saw your mother. <laughs> and he said, you know, you're not doing her any favors. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you're going there for breakfast, lunch and dinner but there are 24 hours in this day and your mother is getting herself into trouble because she's alone the rest of that time. And you cannot keep eyes on her like this. She needs to be surrounded by people. And it just sort of like, it just rang a bell in my head when he said that it's not that I was letting her down and breaking my word. I was getting her surrounded by people because she was a danger to herself at that point. Um, And I had to tell her that her roof had a leak and she couldn't live in that house because they had to tear the entire roof off to fix it. And we needed to put her somewhere, somewhere like a hotel for just the amount of time that the roof was going to be repaired. And she bought it. Excellent. Yeah. But what you're describing right now is a, is a, sort of a conundrum that so many people so many daughters and sons and spouses run into this i made a promise i wouldn't do this one thing yeah but then you find yourself in a place of i don't see 
another solution. I mean, you could pay for 24 hour care. That doesn't always work for everyone. It could be, why is this person in my house? Why is this person in my house? I don't, or they get annoyed that someone's there, or it's just astronomical compared to what you might be able to afford in assisted living. There's so many different things. And so I think it's very hard. I, I, I guess I want to ask you, how did you feel about that? Having made a promise and then, and then not that you broke your promise, but you changed how you were caring for her. How was that for you? Well, I left all those little pieces out because it would take forever for us to have this conversation, but I did do all those things. I did have somebody come. Well, Denise, for one thing, Denise and Ginny, uh, another friend of ours became my daily walkers and they split their time up. So my mother had two visits almost every single day from those two people. Then I tried a, a senior companion. We have the senior companion program in the next town over and they came to our town. I tried that until my mother accused her of stealing from her. And I tried another woman who my mother stopped answering the door as soon as she saw her come up to the front within like the first two visits because she decided that she didn't like her. I tried these things. Um, yeah. I, you know, you just you just keep trying different things and sinking, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, I don't know. I don't know how to put it any other way. Um, I was, you know, a, a physical and emotional wreck. I was breaking out into tears at the post office. Uh, I would be stopped at our local grocery store from somebody who said, oh, how's your mom? And as soon as that happened, you know, mm -hmm. just a deluge of tears coming out. I saw my, my physician for my annual exam and we never did get to my pap smear. She prescribed Prozac for me after having, you know, a 10 minute conversation with me. And I remember that. I, I remember getting that prescription filled at the pharmacy, sitting out in the parking lot and taking two <laughs> with a cold cup of coffee from my console because I was ready to get this. I was ready to feel better, you know, yes. and I was just going to try anything. Um, you, you know, you just find yourself in these positions and, and they're, they're astronomical. Mm, it's desperation. Desperation it is. is a great word for it. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. It's really hard. And we all, we're all telling the same story, aren't we? I mean, within, within reason, we have these, these levels that we go through that I, I feel like, you know, if, when I see somebody now on the street and they say, oh, Carolyn, my husband just got diagnosed with dementia. I mean, I, I, I just, I stand there and I look at them and I don't even have to say a word. I just listen because out it comes and I'm listening to somebody as though I'm looking in a mirror. It's, it's a husband and not a mother. There are different personality factors involved, but but those raw emotions that this person is feeling right then and what, and what they're going to continue to feel. I just, you know, my heart breaks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so during this time um, you're then working, is this when you were, you were working still as a, in real estate? Oh, at that time I had, um, I had, um, uh, multifamily homes. I had, uh, some rentals. I was a landlord. Uh, I had it. a, you know, I just running around. I had a, a gift gallery, uh, uh, rather a group, uh, I called it, it was called the groove studio. It was an art gallery. So I was having shifts there, you know, every, every yeah. busy person's life, you know, yes. describe it. That's, that's what it was. Were you a journaler? Cause I noticed you started to like, maybe take some notes Were you was, was journaling something that was productive for you or helpful. It was one of my assignments by <laughs> from one of my counselors. <laughs> um, start writing things down, and 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 part of writing my book was from retrieving old emails. I had written emails to girlfriends like, "You're not going to believe what my mother just did today," you know, those sorts of things. And uh, and some of those email uh, outclips are in the book, which they're just some of the funnier ones. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was my, my stack of emails that I kept and some journaling that I had kept because I realized at the end, as I started writing, you know, sometimes I would get to a chapter and I would be all caught up and I would wait for the next, you know, 
the next phase story to happen until the inevitable end when I when I ended the book with mom's end of life. But there were times that um, I thought, oh, I wouldn't have even remembered that that thing that happened between us if I hadn't written it down or had sent an email to somebody about it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of the books come from that. A lot of the books that we have in our collection are written through journaling and, and communications with other people. It's really helpful. Yeah. I think it's lovely that you found, you said you were working with a counselor was, so is this somebody from the Alzheimer's association or some other, I mean, whatever support group you joined, it sounds like that was helpful for you. It yes. absolutely was. They, they, they became what I called my AA meetings. Mm-hmm. They were Alzheimer's association meetings. And it was the first and third Thursday of every month at one o'clock at our Panhandle health district. And we just had this little conference room and there were usually about five of us. I found out about it on the library bulletin board when I was there looking for a book one day and I walked in the first day <clears throat> and there were, you know, five of us. And, um, I sat down and I, I fully thought that this wasn't going to help me because this was going to be a group of people who just weren't going to be going through what I was going through. And I listened as they went around the, t- the, the table. And I basically heard the exact same story of something that was going on with me all the way around the table. And by the time they got to me, I was just reduced to tears and I didn't, really need to say much my first meeting because of everything everybody else was contributing. And I went home that day and just thought, oh my God, when can I go back? You know, how, how, how far away is next Thursday at one o'clock, you know, the the second Thursday. Um, And I went all summer to that, to that group. And I learned all about how to get a power of attorney I learned how to get my mother's Medicare card reinstated. I learned how to get a bank account set up for her. I learned how to respond to her in certain situations. Um, And I learned how to journal. And they were the ones also along with Sam nudging me toward getting her a place to stay. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. You got a lot. You sound like you got a lot out of that. And those are all the things that people need to know about. And they, and they don't know, they don't even have a clue that you need right to do there in their own town. Things. Yeah. Our little town of 2,500 people had oh. an Alzheimer's association group. That's wonderful. Yeah. 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 So important. Well, you point to a couple of things that I think caregivers easily forget. One, um, definitely the support group. So important. Um, however, you might be able to find it you know, and then the other one that you, you mentioned earlier, just going to see your doctor. I mean, caregivers, a lot of times run themselves into the ground. And so luckily you had a physician who was like, well, we're going to take care of some of this. Yeah, I I hear stress, Carolyn. So we're going to take some anxiety and stress off the table because I think that's really critical. And so good for you that you took that step to it just, I mean, we talk about self care, and it's not just bubble baths. It's it's also making time to take care of your own health. Right. And what I have no time. I mean, I remember that. I remember people saying, "So, what are you doing for self care, Carol?" And I was like, "Self care? What? What? What is that word?" <laughs> oh yeah, everything exactly. But by the wayside, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. It does. Yeah, it really does. And again, um, I think that phrase, while I really believe it's super important for everybody, it's gotten co-opted into some stuff that maybe isn't really doable for everybody, right? And it like I defined, it needs to be yeah. better defined. Yes. yes. Like you said, the bubble bath, that's the first thing I remember thinking when people <laughs> said that, like, I don't have time for a manicure and a pedicure, you know, <laughs> I yeah. don't have time for a bath. I think it's just like, I, I, I often, t- it's just a time for you to like step away from that part of your life, I think. So and right. to do something that you enjoy, which could be a, a manicure or a bubble bath or just going to the library or getting your annual, annual physical or having coffee with a friend. 
go for my a self care yeah. was, was like a Denise and Jenny situation. Um, like in the book, when, when I knew that Denise was with my mom walking her for that hour, I knew mm-hmm. that I had an hour for free, you know, and same with Jenny, Jenny would show up and she'd usually text me and say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm here with your mom. We're, I'm going to stay for an hour. I would just melt, mm-hmm. you know, like, okay, I'm good for an hour. Mm-hmm. And that was my self care. Yeah. So exactly. How was it that your mom ended up in the nursing home at the end? At uh, at the very end in the nursing home? Yeah. Like what was the steps from she went, she, you got it to the assisted living stage and then, and then fill in the blanks to, to the end. Yeah. In, in our town, we had, um, kind of, kind of three options. We had, um, the, the first one that I sent her to, I changed the names in the book and now I can't remember what I called them. And I have to be careful because you're not, I, you know, I, I really don't want to name the names, but she went to the first one and um, I needed to, I needed to remove her. Uh, there were personalities with the staff and, oh my gosh, Christy, you're talking about being in the industry. I think there's a need in the industry for um, continued education continuing education for caregivers that are in the professional role, because I saw so many personal interactions that were handled person through their personality and not as a caregiver should. It's frightening how, you know, a caregiver could actually become offended by something somebody with dementia said to them (laughs) instead of understanding, you know, that they had dementia and that was happening at the first place. So um, then I took her to the second place. And um, after a little while, a couple of years, she needed to be moved because she was misbehaving um, in Mm. in a large number of ways, including um, theft from Mm. um, individual residents' rooms because she was sure that they had um, her Afghan or they had her her necklace. (laughs) So Mm. she was determined to take those things back to her room. And then there, I don't remember. Oh, how did she get from one to the other to the other? So huge problems at the second place because Mm -hmm. they really were assisted living. They weren't memory care. They weren't equipped for it. And as disappointed as I was, because I was so comfortable with her being there, um, that they had to let her go. And when we brought her across the street to the extended care facility, which is part of the hospital, it didn't seem like she was going to be a good fit because she wasn't there yet. You know, she Mm -hmm. wasn't bedridden. She was very ambulatory and they were positive. They would be fine with her. And I got my um, eviction notice within 28 days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She, um, she was going around into people's rooms because they were calling her in and she would walk by and they would, she'd say hello and they'd call her in and she'd chat with them. And then they would say, Hey, disconnect this. I don't like this alarm on the bed. It keeps going off. Nobody will turn it off for me. So my mother would. And that was what she did from room to room. And they called me and said, your mother's just happily going from room to room, disconnecting all of the bed alarms um, because it started with one and we can't have that. Of course they can't, you know? So yeah. Oh my gosh. I want to laugh because I think it's well, hysterical. Now but it is. on the other hand, at the time, it's like, oh my gosh. Yeah, when totally. They, when they called me, I was on speakerphone and they introduced themselves as, we have our whole committee here, Carolyn. We'd like to speak with you. You know, and I was, oh, what's a whole committee doing on this, on the, you know, and telling me I'm on <laughs> speakerphone? What, what's going on? You know, and that's when mm-hmm. they told me about the alarms. And then the final thing was the um, administrator said, and, your mother came into my office and pooped in my garbage can. And I said, how can that be? And she said, well, I came, I came back into my office. I had stepped out and there she was. And I said, she did that on purpose. And she said, no, I asked her that. (laughs) And I said, Faye, why did you just poop into my garbage can? And my mother said, because your door was open and this is the bathroom. Hmm. So this is, you know, these are the things that, your mother would be mortified if she ever thought that that would be a behavior she would exhibit in her later years. Oh, I, I can't imagine if my mother ever, ever would have, you know, what she would have thought if that had been told to her. Sure. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Terrible, terrible disease. 
So then what happened? We moved her to the next town south of us, <laughs> which was heartbreaking for me because it was 40, 40 minutes, 40 miles, oh, wow. highway miles, deer miles, you know, mm. moose miles. And it just became my, my Monday morning thing to do. And I'd go to go see my mom. Then I'd go to Home Depot, go to Starbucks and get a coffee because we don't have one in our town. And, um, and then come home and, you know, usually cry all the way home. It would, it just be another visit. And it just seemed like not seeing her for a solid week each time was enough to really see differences, but she was in a memory care unit. She was surrounded by people and there was not one time that I dropped in that she was alone or didn't have a a stuffed animal in her lap or Dolly, her doll in her lap or was getting her nails done. It was, it was a really good experience for me to see her that way. She was, mm -hmm. you know, living her life very quietly and, um, and, and still, uh, and still unhappily mostly. I think, I think my mother spent the last years of her life unhappily mm -hmm. uh, in such a confused state and uh an accusatory state of mind that um it breaks my heart for her you know to think that that mm -hmm. those were her last years i was able to manage her quality of care but i wasn't able to manage her quality of life mm -hmm. right That's a great way right. to put it okay mm -hmm. and so then it was covid i was in florida it was the very beginning of it was the end of March and COVID had just been talked about the beginning of March and not, you know, things weren't really happening yet. It was uh, there. People were starting to wear masks. States hadn't shut down yet. Airlines hadn't shut down yet, but they were starting to limit their flights. And I got a phone call from the facility saying they think my mother had a stroke. She wasn't her chirpy self that morning and she didn't seem to be able to move her so one side. So I said, okay, I'm coming home. I called the airlines. I booked my flight for the next day and um, started scurrying around to get uh, my place buttoned down and, and water shut off and water heater shut off. I had a, I had a winter place and um that night I got a text from the airlines that my flight had been moved. And this went on this, this, it was a move and then a cancellation, a move, two more days and a cancellation, another move. It, it went on like this for days mm -hmm. until finally I got a customer service. They got me rerouted. It had gone on for five, I think full days of delays. And each day I checked in and my mother was stable, but you know, I was pulling my hair out. I couldn't get, I couldn't get a different airline. It didn't seem to matter. They were all, New York had just shut down, no more flights going in and out. Um, Idaho had just issued a, a stay at home warning. Florida was just designated a hot spot, and I was in Florida. So I flew through Minneapolis and then around to Spokane on this huge jet with 12 of us on it, mm -hmm. just 12 people. When we got to Minneapolis, we sat there until midnight. We got there in the morning. We had to sit there till midnight because we had no pilot to, to take us from Minneapolis to, to Spokane, Washington. But I, I ended up getting there and I made it to the uh, facility that first thing in the morning. They gloved me up. They gowned me up. We walked down the hallway into a room where my mother was in um, quarantine and they let me in and I sat there and I, I held her and I cried and I did all of the things and Denise was waiting for me in the parking lot. She had come to the airport to get me because it's a two hour drive to our airport. And after about an hour, I hit the button like they instructed me to. And I said, OK, I'm, I'm ready to leave. And um, she said, OK, take everything off at the door, put it in the garbage and let's let's go. I came out of the room and I said, OK, what time tomorrow can I come? You know, how early? And she looked at me and said, this was the nurse. Well, you, you can't. 
And I said, what do you mean? She said, you, well, you can't come back. Didn't they tell you that? And I said, no, what, what are you talking about? She said, oh, this was your visit. You got one visit. You came from a hot spot. We can't afford to risk the lives of others. And I, I get that. You know, I got that. I just wasn't prepared. I had no idea that this was going to happen. So I turned around and I went back in her room and I sat in there and she bopped her head in and she said, you know, it's, it's time you have to leave. So I came out and I, um, I left and I spent the next week again, it was, it was, this was going on. I spent the next week um, outside her window looking in like this because they wouldn't let me in. So I would stand there with my hands up to the glass with the water dripping off the eave down into my back of my coat because it was winter time and uh, or early spring and, um, and just stare at her. Then they let us do FaceTime. But there was no talking to my mother because she was just laying there with her eyes closed. So they would hold the um, iPad up to her face so that I could look at her and, and just tell her I loved her. Until uh, one day my phone rang and it was a doctor from the facility who said, hi, this is Dr. Christensen. And I'm just calling to tell you last night um, they tried to give your mother an IV and they couldn't. Um, they couldn't find um, a vein. And I said, Dr. Christensen, I have an order that says no IVs, you know, no, no medicines. And he said, no, this is just uh, um, hydration. And that doesn't qualify. That's different. And I said, please don't have them put another needle in her. And he said, okay, I can do that. And I said, is this your opinion that th we're at the end now? And he said, yes, it is. And I said, well, can I please come see her? Please let me come see her. And he was quiet for a second. He said, what do you mean? You haven't been able to come see her? And I said, no, they have not let me back since my first visit last week. And he said, hold on a second. And he came back to the phone and he said, by all means, you can come back and see your mother. Please, please come now. I don't think mm -hmm. I even turned the coffee pot on or off. I, I didn't brush my teeth. It was morning. I just grabbed some pants. I don't know how I got from Bonners Ferry to Sandpoint, Idaho. I just, I just appeared miraculously at that back door, gowned me up again, gloves, hat, and everything. And I went to the door with the same nurse. And she said to me, now, you know, this is your last visit. So stay in there for as long as you need to, because you, when you come out, we can't let you back in. I went in there and I stayed there for 72 hours. Hmm. And I, I just, I stayed with her. I talked with her. I had no phone. I had, I had nothing to, to change into. Um, my boots and my coat were out front in the, in the uh, front area of the facility. And um, I was able to, I was able to be with her during her final, final day, uh, hours. Such an incredible oh my. story. Yeah, it was it was horrible. And I was the lucky one. I was one mm -hmm. of the ones who got to be with her. All these people that we read about and we saw on Facebook who weren't even able to be with their spouse and their parent or their child. Mm -hmm. Heartbreaking. Yeah. Brutal. Brutal. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. I tried to whiz through that. I mean, it was a, it's a long story. It's all these right. details. I did no, put them it's... all in the book. Yes, you, yeah. you have to read the read it in the yeah. book. It was just couldn't stop. Yeah, you you just can't stop. Yeah, you have to read the it, whole thing. It was a terrible, a terrible thing for anybody to go through. Just terrible. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in the end, they were so lovely uh, when they came in, and I finally, I finally called them in, and I had to, I had to go into the bathroom every single time a nurse came in. That was the agreement we had for the seventy two hours that I was there. When I finally told them I wasn't leaving, they called the hospital administrator and um, the agreement was I would stay in the bathroom every time a nurse or an orderly came in hmm. and then come out when they left. That was our way of somehow protecting, you know, each other from getting my potential COVID from having traveled. Yeah. So she did then actually have a stroke do you know that that was the case yeah she it was didn't... evident her, oh her left side was affected yeah. completely yeah. Mm. yeah so 
<laughs> I'm so sorry. That is just sounds mm -hmm. so just devastating the whole thing. Yeah. And such an awful time. And it's awful for everyone. You know, yes. I, I will not, I will never claim to have had it worse than anyone else because the stories that I hear from so many people now, people send me emails through my website. Um, I've had, uh, you know, comments at uh, talks that I've given, you know, somebody always wants to pull me aside and say, this is what's happening to me. And I'll listen and I'll think, yeah, that's pretty much what happened to me. And the 12 people before you that came to me, it's just absolutely horrific what this disease does to people, to the caregiver and to the person afflicted with it. Absolutely. I think that's one of the beauties of Al's authors is that we have these chronicles now of what life was, has been like for so many people in so many different circumstances. I think what's really important about your book is your, you and a couple of our other um, newer authors just chronicling this time period in history that was so different and so devastating for so many people. And I, but, but that human story of like, just watching your mom um, go through these different stages due to a disease that we don't know enough about and, and can't really control or cure. And it, it, it does, it changes us. It changes, it definitely changes our person. So I guess that's, that's the question I have for you is, is how, how has this experience of going through this with your mom and now, and then writing the story, how has this changed you? When I wrote the book, I thought I was writing it for people who were feeling alone. And I wanted them to know that, no, you're not alone. That you know, Others have gone through this just like you, you're going to be okay and, and, and hang in there. And then later I realized that, yeah, that was part of it, but Really what I think I would like my reader to feel is encouragement toward being more loving during this process. We get caught up in the day-to-day -day business of taking care of business. You know, we have schedules to maintain. We've got clothes to get them to put on. We've got to get them fed. We've got to get them cared for. And we've got to live our own lives. Did we plan for this, this new person that needs our help in ways that we don't even know how to help them? We didn't. We didn't ask for it. And, and, and here it is. It's in our laps now. While we're trying to maintain our own relationships and our own careers and our own families, right? So it's so easy to get caught up in the responsibility, I think, of caregiving, that obligation. And it's hard not to be resentful. And I think what I really learned from this whole thing is trying to find the humor and the the, the spirit of of actual loving this person who has become oftentimes unlovable, you know, oftentimes they show you their ugliest self and it's hard. I mean, it's the human condition to defend yourself, you know, against, against this moral attack they're, they're putting out towards you. Um, and, and I think that I have learned to try to take that little step back and maybe ask myself, what's going on with them today? You know, what, what's happening that's making this person be Behave in a way that is not the person I'm used to. And, and, and then trying to find a way to get over that initial feeling of wanting to say, hey, you know, I didn't deserve that, you know, knock it off kind of, you know, kind of thing. So I think I think that's where I where I'm at these days is, you know, find that love, you know, find that love it's because yeah. your person was that loving person that you fell in love with you know i fell in love with my mother from my very earliest age you know she was my hero and i learned all of the good things from her I, to this day i talk about all of the good things i learned from my mother yet those last years caring for her were filled with disappointment and resentment toward her because of because of this new person she had become that I didn't recognize anymore. And you really have to dig deep, you know, to, to, to remember the other. Yeah, absolutely. 
How have your siblings responded to the book? Um, <laughs> about the same way as they did while I was caring for my mom, I guess. <laughs> have they read it? I'd like to say yes. Okay. <laughs> you know, they got, they got an autographed copy. Of course they yeah. did. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you come prepared to read something from the book? No. Well, I do have it here. Yes. Uh, it's beautiful. I know. I love the cover. I guess I could just start with the first couple of sentences. How much time would you like me to? Well, just a couple of minutes. Okay. Well, this is, to me, this is the, 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 the kind of the funniest part from the, the very first paragraph entitled, She Was Just Getting Old. And it's year one, stage two, age-associated memory impairment. Morning, ma'am. This is Lieutenant Davey from Franklin County Sheriff's Department. I'm calling about your mother. It was 5 a.m. Idaho time, too early for my alarm clock and birds, really. The room was black, and I had just been jarred awake by the insistent shrill of my phone, setting every nerve in my body on high alert. We're real worried about her, been cutting calls, been getting calls about her driving on the wrong side of the road, cutting people off, that sort of thing. He began recounting each of the complaints he'd recently received as I blinked my eyes into focus and forced myself to concentrate. I cleared my throat. Well, could you pull her over next time? Maybe give her a ticket? Can you take away her license or something? No, ma'am. Can't do that until I see her do it myself. I was hoping you could talk to her. Talk to her. I lived 3,000 miles away from my mother's rural North Georgia town where she lived by herself, a fiercely independent and very proud 79-year-old. I knew exactly how that call from me would be received. Hey, mom, I heard you've been driving erratically these days. Seems you're causing a lot of concern around town. Maybe it's time for you to give up your driver's license. Where did I hear that? Oh, um, from your town sheriff who heard it from your friends and neighbors. It took me three short seconds to, re to consider the repercussions of making a call like that, leaving no doubt in my mind that things were just going to have to work themselves out without my help. Hmm. Uh, yeah. I just kept it short. I don't know if you really, you don't really want me to read a lot. Do you? No, that's fine. Yeah. No, that was good. That was great. That's I great. mean, it definitely gives a flavor of, Exactly. Your writing, which is beautiful. Well, you, beautiful. you get a call from your sheriff and he's telling you to call your mother and tell her that, you know, yeah. she's just been tattled on you know, yeah. <laughs> by her friends and neighbors. You know, I'm sure that would have just gone over. It's like nobody knew what to do in the situation. Right. He wanted all the levels. Something. I wanted him to do something. He didn't know how to handle the situation because he would have understood that mm -hmm. they were, you know. No, absolutely not. That wasn't going to work. Yeah. It's interesting. So um, how do people find you on, on social media, on the web, what, yeah. got a website? I have a website, uh, carolynbeerl.com. And um, I also have a Facebook page, uh, author Carolyn Beerl. And let's see, I also have an Instagram account, same thing, author Carolyn Beerl. You can find uh, me on Goodreads. And, and of course, the book is on Amazon. Uh, you can order it from your local bookstore. You could also go straight to the library. You don't have to buy the book. You can just ask the book to, uh, ask the library to order your book in our library loan for you. Um, I've, and it's kind of cool because I get reports from my library here in town when they get an order for an interlibrary loan. And like the other day I was like, hey, somebody from Iowa just ordered your book. <laughs> and then they just send it across and, and send it That's back. Great. Yeah, yeah I love that. Yeah. Well, and it's, it looks like you have paper book, hardcover, a Kindle, which is awesome also, and an audio book. So that's fantastic. Yeah. So that's really great. I, I did have somebody um, narrate my book for me. I, I had 15 different auditioners and then I sent the top three around to my friends and all, almost unanimously, my friends chose a narrator that wasn't my first choice. So I, I yeah. chose the one that the, my friends all took just I, I assumed there was a safety in numbers kind of thing. Yeah, sure. But that's so important, I think, for caregivers because um, podcasts like this and audiobooks are so helpful because 
you know, we might be going from one place to the other. And so sitting down to a book might be a little hard, but we want to engage with authors like you who can tell us about their story and right. some hope and some insight. So it's fantastic. So thank you for doing that. You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a pleasure Great. coming on your show on your, on your book talk. Oh, thank you. Miss. Really appreciate that. Is there anything else you would like to tell the listeners before we say goodbye? Yeah. You know, hang in there. I, you know, these cliche sentences, I, I, Sometimes I feel like there isn't anything that is going to be poignant enough to to really strike that chord, you know, in somebody's heart that's going through something like this at the time that they're going through it. Um, maybe really what I would say is, is 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 don't stop talking about it, you know, whether it's to a friend, whether it's to, you know, if you go to church, you know, your pastor, you know, your doctor. You know, there's, there's, a, if you would rather do it with a stranger, you know, call the 800 number with Alzheimer's Association. They're open 24 hours a day. You can pick up that phone at three in the morning and talk to somebody, you know, if you don't want to have your family business, you know, shared with somebody, you know, wh whatever it is, just don't stop. Don't stop talking about it because there are people that can help you in some small way. Mm. That's a great message. Thank you so Absolutely. much. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. This has been such a pleasure. And um, yeah, I really appreciate your your comments. Well, thank you. It's great. like eight o'clock there, right? You poor people. Yeah. Go go home. <laughs> are you me. home? Are you? Not for me. I'm in California. I'm it's oh, just okay. uh it's five, yeah, so too. we're yeah. good. I'm in New York. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is eight o'clock. Okay. Well, that was great. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to Untangling Alzheimer's and Dementia, an Alls Authors podcast. For more details on this episode, please see the show notes. If you enjoyed the podcast, please leave a review and subscribe to it on whichever platform you use to listen to your favorite podcasts. For more information on Alls Authors, please visit allsauthors.com. While you're there, be sure to browse our online bookstore, where you will find hundreds of carefully vetted books on Alzheimer's and dementia. You can also find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Please email your thoughts on the podcast to allsauthors at gmail.com. We are a 501c3 charitable organization, totally reliant on donations to do what we do. If our author's stories move you, please consider contributing to our cause. Remember, you are not alone. One can sing a lonely song, but we chose to form a choir and create harmony. I'm Susan Landeis of All's Authors. If you're listening to this podcast, you may be looking for more support on your dementia journey. Please visit our website at allsauthors.com, where you'll find hundreds of carefully vetted resources written by caregivers and professionals in Alzheimer's and dementia care. You'll get knowledge, comfort, and support through books, blogs, podcasts, films, and more. That's allsauthors.com. Remember, you are not alone.